This okay. conference will now be recorded. All right, well, we're going to kick it off. Uh, thanks, everyone, for bearing with the uh, technical glitches here. And um, my name is Marcus Roth. I am the communications director for COHIO, uh, the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio. Um, we are going to talk about the growing economic struggles that this pandemic-induced recession is inflicting on the Ohioans who can least afford it. Um, we believe that ensuring that people can get their basic humans, human needs met during a global pandemic should be a bipartisan issue. Um, but first, we're going to hear from Jory Novotny. She's the Director of External Affairs for the Ohio Association of Food Banks. Then we'll hear from my boss, Bill Faith. He's the Executive Director of COHIO. Um, he's going to talk about the horrors of evictions and homelessness confronting people during this pandemic. And then we'll hear from Tracy Najera. She's the executive director of the Children's Defense Fund, Ohio. Um, she's gonna talk about the growing needs facing Ohio's children during this pandemic. Um, and then we'll have some time for any questions you might have afterwards. So, Jory, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Marcus. And thanks to each of you for joining us today and for your attention to these critical issues. Like Marcus said, my name is Jory Novotny, and I'm proud to serve as Director of External Affairs for the Ohio Association of Food Banks. We joined with our fellow advocates to convene this briefing because we are at a critical crossroads. Many of you probably feel that we've been raising alarm bells for months, and that's because we have been, because we all saw this coming. Along with service providers and anti-poverty advocates across the country, we've been urging the same relief measures since the summer when it was clear the early relief packages passed by congress would expire long before the public health and economic crises had subsided now congress and particularly the senate have two divergent paths to choose from we are currently on a path that brings no additional stopgap measure stopgap measures for struggling households Right now, Ohio's Emergency Hunger Relief Network is serving 120,000 to 150,000 more people each month than we were one year ago. These are displaced workers, workers who have left the labor market to protect their health or the health of their loved ones, or to provide caregiving to children learning remotely, seniors and people living with disabilities who may be isolated from their other support networks. And of course, these are families with children, children who are bearing far too much of the burden now and who will bear the long-term costs of our failure to act if we continue down this path. The reality is that the effects of this virus on families, communities, and local economies are far from over. It takes years, not weeks, to recover from this kind of large-scale shift in the labor market and this kind of drawn-out crisis. This is not as simple as a temporary improvement to the unemployment rate. Frontline workers earning low wages in food service, home health care, hospitality and entertainment, retail, janitorial services, and other sectors that have been hard hit were already living paycheck to paycheck, each day with fewer tips, each week with reduced hours at work, each month with a school-aged child learning remotely, means less income to get by, less ability to afford enough food, and greater likelihood of all of the negative consequences of food insecurity down the road. Feeding America's most recent estimates indicate that nearly one in five people in Ohio, including more than one in four children in Ohio, have experienced food insecurity in 2020. That is just completely unacceptable. Hunger should not be a legacy of this pandemic. Every day that the Senate hems and haws over whether things are bad enough to provide more relief is another day borrowed from the future of our children. So here's our message from the front line. It's bad enough. It's as bad as ever. We have food banks right now buying up tents, heaters, and shovels to make sure our local food pantries can keep parking lots clear and volunteers and staff safe while they load groceries into waiting cars throughout the difficult winter ahead. The generosity of our communities has been profound and humbling and has helped to keep not only our trucks, but also our spirits fueled over the past nine months. 
We have an incredible group of 360 Ohio National Guard soldiers and airmen serving at our warehouses, packing and distributing millions of pounds of food each month. We're delivering food to those in quarantine, partnering with school districts to send groceries home with take home school meals, doing everything we can think of to fill gaps and keep up the pace. And we will have a much tougher time doing that come January if the USDA doesn't extend its commodity purchasing programs to keep additional food coming into our warehouses. And if the Trump administration doesn't extend federal funding for the National Guard. The charitable health and human services sectors were not built, designed, or intended to provide wholesale, long-term, community-wide relief for problems caused by a national public health emergency. That's what the public safety net is for. And right now, our public safety net isn't meeting the needs of the people it is supposed to protect. Our unemployment compensation system is inadequate. SNAP benefits have not been boosted at all for vulnerable families with children. And the moratorium on evictions, while a necessary band-aid, has not provided actual rent or mortgage relief, but rather delayed the inevitable. Congress can follow a different path in the next few days. They can agree that basic needs should be bipartisan. They should provide a 15% boost to SNAP benefits to help put more food on the table while infusing additional revenue into local economies. They should extend jobless benefits for displaced workers. They should provide emergency rental assistance to help families stay in their homes. They should provide more aid to state and local governments to prevent cuts in critical services. They should choose to come together now so that we aren't left to reap more unnecessary fallout from this public health crisis. None of us can prevent all of the stark and painful consequences of COVID-19, but we don't have to let those consequences compound as they are right now. There's still time to stop families from falling off the approaching cliff. I'll let Bill talk more about what that cliff could look like if Congress doesn't act. Okay, I'll take that as my cue. Um, so yeah, I I just want to step back for a second and uh, you know just sort of relate to where everybody is at these days. I think we're we're all feeling stressed out. You know, we worry about how to keep ourselves and our families safe and sane during this pandemic and uh, particularly as we head into this winter with the um, you know unprecedented spike in cases that our health officials are telling us will only get worse before it gets better. So now imagine how much more you'd be worried if you didn't have a place to call home. And that's the re reality. Um, facing hundreds of thousands of Ohioans who've lost income during this pandemic or, or have seen their income uh, decline or go away. 342,000 Ohio households are behind in their rent. That's 20% of Ohio's 1.7 million renter households. Um, 188,000 of them believe that they they will have to they will be evicted over the next two months 188,000 um so we do appreciate i want to point out that the dewine administration did come up with some money out of the coronavirus relief fund of 55 million that they distributed last month um it actually started a little bit into october um, and that money has already been depleted in many cases around the state. The um, Columbus Impact Hope Fund, which is one eviction prevention program, they um, they reopened their program about three weeks ago when they got their allocation of about five million dollars. And within three days, they had more demand than they could meet with that five million. Um, so that money is 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 now been allocated. We're expecting another round of money from the state uh, to come coming later in the, this month or early in January. But again, it will only provide assistance sufficient 
to cover some people for a matter of, of a month or two. So without a, a, a federal response, we, I just fear what's going to happen this winter as more and more people are faced with the hard reality of losing their housing in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this winter. Um, we looked at, you know, what are people doing to get by in, in, with the absence of sufficient income and in the absence of other relief heading their way. And what we're seeing is people are pulling money out of wherever they could find it. Their savings is getting depleted. People are tapping their retirement funds if they have them. Um, people are putting um, their rent on their credit card if they have any room left on their credit card. The Federal Reserve estimates that there's been a 70% increase in pe uh, people paying their rent by credit card this year. Um, so the, um, you know, this is not just an issue for the people, for those families, it puts a burden on the entire community. It puts a burden on their, their families that they're asking for assistance or the families that they are doubling up with, creating more overcrowded conditions where the virus can spread quickly. Um, the CDC, recognizing the health concerns of eviction, of people being sent to shelters that are overcrowded or being sent to the streets or being sent to overcrowded, doubled up situations, did issue uh, an order, a moratorium, uh, banning eviction until the end of this month, the end of December. Um, the eviction, that moratorium did not work very well. Um, Landlords challenged it. They, there's been court battles on it. A lot of courts haven't recognized the moratorium. It's just there's been all kinds of problems and a lack of enforcement of that CDC moratorium. But um, it, that ends at the end of December. So even people that did get covered by that, that's going to go away um, in, a, in the next few weeks. So it will mean that all of those evictions that did not proceed because of the moratorium, they can now proceed starting January 1st. Um, we did check in with our uh, homeless groups around the state recently, and the vast majority are close to capacity or already um, overcrowded. They have tried to keep their numbers down to avoid spreading the COVID virus. Um, they are all, just about all of them are reporting increases in unsheltered homelessness in their communities as more people um, are staying in their cars or in campgrounds or in other, um, other situations like that. Um, all of the groups are also very concerned about homelessness increasing in the next couple of months. Um, and they, they're really worried about being able to get through this winter. Um, they're seeing a lot of new faces. And I know this is also true with the food programs. There's a lot of people that have never been homeless before. People that for the first time in their lives are because of their loss of jobs. Um, are, are struggling to remain housed. Many groups have resorted to housing people in hotels and motels in various parts of the state, but their capacity to, to do that is limited by the lack of resources to pay those bills. Um, so uh, Cincinnati's had a 35% increase in unsheltered homelessness. Um, you know, there's, Springfield is had a really bad report, which their demand for, for shelter is now seven, seven times what it was at the beginning of the pandemic. So they're overwhelmed with families and children who are seeking shelter, and they've just run out of places to put people. Um, and so it's, it's a very desperate situation in Springfield. And I worry that that's kind of like the canary in the coal mine, that what's happening in Springfield could well be happening in more communities 
uh, as we go forward this winter. Um, and as we talked about, you know, the Senate has refused to take action on a relief bill. The House passed a very large relief bill um, late uh, or late last spring, and that's been pending all this time. There is efforts by some to forge some kind of compromise package, but some of those proposals don't even include rental assistance um, or any assistance on homelessness, just as a couple of examples. So we're hoping there was a proposal that emerged this week that does include some rent relief. We're hoping that that, that proposal gains steam, but as we know, um, the Congress is looking to go on holiday break here in, the, in, a, in a week or two. And if they don't get this done, we're gonna have to wait till well into January before there's another opportunity. So that's why we're here today, just to put the uh, pressure on to get a relief package going. Senator Portman's in a key position to forge a bipartisan agreement. And we hope he'll do that uh, but make sure that the proposal includes emergency relief for people that are homeless and emergency rent relief. So I'll pass it off to Tracy. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jory. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. My name is Tracy Nahera, and I'm Executive Director of the Children's Defensement of Ohio. We're a multi-issue child advocacy organization focused on children from prenatal through age 18 and transitions to adulthood. Our focus is on whole child well-being. So let us be clear, though children are 20% of our population here in Ohio, they absolutely represent 100% of our future. We urge Congress to safeguard our future by acting now and making sure children and families have the resources they need to meet their basic needs. As you've heard from my colleagues, Jory and Bill, Ohio families are struggling to meet the needs of their children. This pandemic has affected all aspects of family well-being and stability, making it challenging for them to manage finances, school, work, and mental health. Right now is when we need leadership and support from our policy leaders. It's stunning that we would punish anyone right now for being unable to earn enough income to support their families' basic needs. We have hundreds of thousands of children learning remotely who need support from parents or caregivers, a deadly virus that poses significant risk to public health and a crippling, crippled economy. Yet every day, we're letting children fall through the cracks and suffer needlessly. Our children need Congress to come together and to do their job for them. And our children are facing a lack of food insecurity, um, or I'm sorry, lack of food security, not being able to make rent or mortgage payments, not having health insurance, and feelings of depression and hopelessness. Even before the pandemic hit, more than 466,000 Ohio children lived in poverty, and 131,000 lacked health insurance. In fact, Ohio was a top 10 state for um, some pretty horrible indicators of how our children were struggling in areas of infant mortality, drops in child insurance coverage rates, poor educational and life outcomes for children emancipating from foster care, and the number of adverse childhood experiences experienced by Ohio children under the age of 17, and truly the list goes on. However, we are thankful for the work of the DeWine administration in addressing many of these issues in Ohio over the past several years. However, the current pandemic threatens these positive steps forward. Now the COVID-19 crisis appears to have widened disparities across races and ethnicities, according to um, the, uh, the US Census Bureau's household um, poll surveys, which include recent data um, that from Ohio and all other 50 states. For example, more black adults in households with children weren't confident that they could pay next month's rent or mortgage, nearly three times the rate of white families. Now getting into a little bit more about that household poll survey that we're looking at in regards to whole child well-being, 14% of Ohio families with children reported in October 
that there was sometimes or always not enough to eat in their household. Sadly, this is not new for many families. 13% responded that they did not have enough food to eat prior to the pandemic either. So though we have issues of child hunger, it has worsened as a result of this pandemic. Nearly one in six Ohio families with children, or 15%, said they, on, they had only slight confidence or no confidence at all that they would be able to make their next rent or mortgage payment on time. One in 14 Ohio families with children, or 7%, lack health insurance. In the middle of a pandemic, this, this could be deadly. A fifth of Ohio resident respondents with children in their household, or 23%, reported that they had felt down, depressed, or hopeless in the previous week, indicating a widespread need for access to mental health services. We are urging Congress to get back to work for the American people, for Ohioans, to help struggling families and children during this historic time so they can be safe and secure while we navigate through these turbulent waters. And just another point, um, this isn't just coming from Children's Defense Fund, right? This is coming from many different groups, from many different sectors. In fact, Moody's Analytics forecasts that without more aid to the states, the economy will fall into a new recession next year with unemployment approaching 10%, further negatively impacting children and families throughout the Buckeye states and impacting their whole child well-being. And this isn't just impacting their well-being in this, in this point in time, but we're talking about um, negative impacts that will last for years, for years afterwards. What we need is fiscal relief for families through renewal of stimulus payments. We need extension of emergency paid leave and sick days. We're at a point in time when the COVID-19 pandemic is surging and it's unfair for people to make impossible choices between their health and their economic security. We need support for childcare, especially at a time where Ohio's at risk of losing much of its childcare capacity across the state which has painstakingly been built over the last several decades. We need fiscal lifelines for local and state governments to help them protect critical services during this time. And of course, housing and rental assistance. The moratorium is scheduled to expire at the end of December, and we must do all we can to help struggling families to avoid this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, I think now if uh, any members of the media would like to ask a question, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, fire away. I have a question. Go ahead, Judy. Okay. Um, <laughs> we just read an article that says the governor has a... Um, dashboard showing state expenditures of state allocations for COVID. We have 2.4 billion unspent. Isn't it easier? Wouldn't it be easier to make your case to the governor and get some of that money? Well, we have been making that case, Judy, as you probably noticed. We, uh, at this point, that it, by the time that money would get released, the, the money would lapse. So right now, it, 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 that money expires at the end of December. Um, it just, you know, so we did get an allocation of 55 million from that source. Uh, Development Services Agency also provided 55.8 million. Of, of CDBG funds, which is another federal pot. Um, and th both of those are for emergency rental assistance and related costs. So that, that money is what's being used right now. Um, but what we really need is money that goes into next year. I mean, money that can start in January and that could continue along for many months next year. And if Congress were to act to extend the life of those funds, in other words, extend the deadline for how long that 
coronavirus relief dollars would last, that, that money could be available for at least the purposes I've been talking about. But right now, that's not on the table. That's not, um, you know, if they get a relief package passed, that could be a source of money uh, to approve this. I think the governor is also dealing with a lot of other demands, but we would hope that they would prioritize these emergency human human need issues. Does anyone else have any other questions? Let's see, anybody unmuted here? Well, if that's it, nobody else has any other questions. We will be available to uh, for follow-up um, questions later in the day. Um, I believe uh, Jory through the Food Bank Association will be sending out um, a press release later and there'll be uh, information for um, contacting us as well afterwards. Um, so with that, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Um, and we really appreciate the coverage. And thank you so much. Bye-bye.